This tutorial is all about reacting masses, in other words being able to work out what mass of product you might expect to get given a certain mass of the reactants. In order to do these types of calculations we have to use the periodic table to find the relative atomic mass of each element and uh, from the formula of a compound be able to work out the relative formula mass. You're given a periodic table in your exam paper and therefore you don't have to learn anything from this but you do have to know which of the two numbers you have to use. The relative atomic mass as you can see here on the key is the top of the two numbers so for boron this would be 11 and in most cases as you can see um, they are whole numbers, they're rounded to a whole number. There are occasions, copper and chlorine, where these aren't whole numbers. Let's have a look at why this is. It's because the relative atomic mass is the mass of an atom of an element, but not necessarily all the atoms of a particular element weigh exactly the same. Uh, there are things called isotopes, which are atoms of the same element, but which have different numbers of neutrons, and therefore a different uh, mass number. And where there are significant numbers of more than one isotope, then the average sometimes works out at uh, not a whole number, but at a, uh, a decimal. For example, chlorine has these two isotopes, one which weighs 35 and one which weighs 37, in a 3 to 1 ratio. And that means that the average one works out at 35.5. As we go through this tutorial in particular, don't be afraid to stop the tutorial at any point to read the uh, information on each of the slides because I'll have to go through this relatively quickly. First of all then, how do we work out the relative formula mass of a compound? Well, here the compound is sulfuric acid, H2SO4. You've got to understand what this formula means and what the numbers mean and what they refer to. Well, H2SO4 means that there are two hydrogens, because the number 2 comes directly after the H, but there's one sulfur, an invisible one that uh, you don't bother writing, and there's four oxygens. So if each hydrogen from the periodic table has a relative atomic mass of 1, two hydrogens will weigh 2 times 1, which is 2. Each sulfur weighs 32, so one sulfur will weigh 1 times 32, which is 32, and each oxygen weighs 16, so four oxygens in the formula will weigh 4 16, so 64. Add the 2, the 32, and the 64 together, and we get what's called the relative formula mass, or the mass of one formula of the compound, which is 98. Sometimes we have to cope with a formula with brackets and what this means is that the uh, number outside the bracket multiplies everything inside the bracket by that number. So, looking at this aluminium uh, sulfate formula, the 2 here refers only to the aluminium, so there's 2 aluminiums, 2 lots of 27 which weighs 54, but rather than being 1 sulphur, there's 3 lots of 1 which is 3 sulphurs, 3 times 32 which is the relative atomic mass for sulphur, comes to 96. And there's four oxygens in the bracket, but that's multiplied by three outside the bracket. So three fours are 12, and therefore there's 12 oxygens. 12 uh, lots of 16, because that's the relative atomic mass of oxygen, is 192. Top these up, and we get the relative formula mass of 342. Here's an exam question on this topic. Urea is another fertilizer that can be made from ammonia. Urea has the formula NH2 twice CO. What's the relative formula mass for urea? Well, here let's work out how many of each atom we've got. Well, nitrogen, there's two lots of nitrogen. So there's two nitrogens. Uh, there's two hydrogens in the bracket multiplied by two, so that's four hydrogens. There's one carbon and there's one oxygen. If we top these up, the two nitrogens weigh 14 each, which is 28. The four hydrogens weigh one each, which is four. The one carbon is one lot of 12, which is 12. And the one oxygen is one lot of 16, which is 16. And if we add all those up, we get a total of 60 for the relative formula mass. At a higher level, we need to be able to interpret chemical equations quantitatively, and that means by using maths, and calculate the masses of products or reactants from balanced symbol equations using these relative formula masses. How then do we go about using the equation? Here we've got a reaction between magnesium and iodine, making magnesium iodide, and in symbols, Mg plus I2 gives MgI2. 
Well, one atom of magnesium from the equation would react with one molecule of iodine to make one molecule of magnesium iodide, or one formula of it, if you like. Well, one atom of magnesium weighs 24 from the periodic table, that's the relative atomic mass, and the relative formula mass of iodine, well, that's two lots of iodine atoms, which is two lots of 127 from the periodic table, gives us 254. The relative formula mass of magnesium iodide is made up of, well, it's 124 for the magnesium, and two lots of 127 for the iodines works out at 278. Now, let's scale up to grams, then. If I'd used not 24 units but 24 grams of magnesium, you'd expect it to react with not 254 units but 254 grams of iodine to make not 278 units but 278 grams of magnesium iodide. But what if I'd used 24? Yes, I would have got 278. But if I'd used 2.4 grams of magnesium, how much of the magnesium iodide would I get? Well, this is where we rely on logic. If I'm using one-tenth the amount of the magnesium, I'd expect to get one-tenth the amount of magnesium iodide, in other words, 27.8 grams. Here's another example. Taking this equation of magnesium reacting with sulfuric acid to make magnesium sulfate and hydrogen, what mass of magnesium sulfate would you be making if you'd used 4.8 grams of magnesium reacting with an excess or more than enough sulfuric acid. Now you might want to stop the uh, tutorial at this stage to have a go at this question. Next slide um, will be the answer. Now the way we do this is we look at the equation and from the equation one atom of magnesium reacts with sulfuric acid to make one molecule or one formula of magnesium sulfate. Now, magnesium is 24, so think 24 grams, and magnesium sulfate adds up to 24 plus a 32 plus 4 lots of 16, 120, so think 120 grams. So if I'd used 24 grams of magnesium, I'd have got 120 grams of magnesium sulfate. But of course, we've only got, in the question, 4.8 grams of magnesium. So what's the relationship between 24 and 4.8? Well, 4.8 is like if you double it and then tenth it, that gives you 4.8. So double 24 gives you 24 times 2, this is 48. And then divide by 10, uh, 4.8. So if we do the same to the 120, let's double it, um, 240, and then one tenth, uh, 24. So that works out at uh, 24 grams of magnesium sulfate. You see, 4.8 is 4.8 twenty fourths of the amount of magnesium, so you'd expect to get 4.8 twenty fourths the amount of magnesium sulfate as well. And when we do that, 4.8 twenty fourths is like a fifth, so you'd expect to get a fifth the amount of magnesium sulfate if we use a fifth the amount of magnesium. That's the principle anyway. Here's another question using the same principle. Iron oxide and carbon making iron and carbon dioxide. What mass of iron would be made if we'd used 36 kilograms of iron oxide with an excess of carbon? Now, again, you can stop the presentation and have a go at this question, or the answer will come up on the next slide. Now, from the equation, we've got iron oxide here making iron. The iron oxide... Uh, two molecules of iron oxide make two atoms of iron. Now, what does one molecule of iron oxide weigh? Well, that's 56 and 16, which is 72. So two molecules would be 144. 144 of this would make two lots of iron, which is two lots of 56, which is 112. So 144 of this on the left would make 112 of this on the right. But we've got 36 kilograms, so we've got to look at a relationship between 36 and the 144. Well, from your 12 times table, you know they're both in the 12 times table. Um, 36 is like a quarter of 144. So you'd expect to get like a quarter of 112. So a quarter of 112 would be 28. But of course, because this is in kilograms, then 36 kilograms would give 28 kilograms of the iron. 
Here's a past exam question then. Look at the equation for the reaction between iron and sulfur making iron sulfide. Jake and Monty use 5.6 grams of iron. How much iron sulfide can they make? Now we're told that the relative atomic mass of iron is 56 and of sulfur is 32. So for the iron sulfide, the relative formula mass of iron sulfide would be 56 plus 32, which is 88. Now converting that into grams, if I'd used 56 grams, it would have reacted with 32 grams to make 88 grams, but I've only used 5.6 grams. Therefore, that's one-tenth the amount. So I can only expect to get one-tenth the amount of the iron sulfide, which would be one-tenth of 88, which would be 8.8 .8 grams. So therefore, mass of iron sulfide would be... Um, 5.6 over 56 equals 1 tenth times 88 grams equals 8.8 .8 grams. And how much sulfur must they use? Well, again, 56 grams reacts with 32 grams of sulfur. So 5.6 grams, which is 1 tenth, would react with 1 tenth the amount of sulfur. 1 tenth of 32 uh, works out at... Well, one tenth times 32 grams would be 3.2 grams of sulfur. Another question, calcium carbonate reacts with hydrochloric acid to make these products. We are given the symbol equation and we're asked to calculate the mass of the calcium chloride that could be made from 50 grams of calcium carbonate. Now let's first of all work out the MR or the relative atomic mass of calcium carbonate. That would be 1 calcium, which is 40, plus 1 carb, which is 12, plus 3 lots of oxygen, which is 3 lots of 16, comes out at 100. Uh, and then we work out the relative atomic mass for the calcium chloride, the product. Well, that would be 1 calcium, which is 40, plus 2 lots of chlorine, which is 35.5, comes out to 111. So if I had used 100 grams of this, I could have got 111 grams of this, but I haven't started off with 100 grams. I've only started off with 50. Therefore, if I've started off with 50 grams of calcium carbonate, which is a half of 100, I would expect to get a half of 111 grams, which is 55.5 grams. Now onto something called the law of conservation of mass and how we can use relative formula masses to show that mass is conserved in a chemical reaction. You should learn the law of conservation of mass which says that the total mass of the products is the same as the total mass of the reactants and we can show this using this equation here between iron and copper sulfate. If we look at the formula the relative atomic masses and relative formula masses of each of the reactants and products. Iron is 56 relative atomic mass. Copper sulfate, we add up the copper of 63.5 to the sulfur, which is 32, and the four oxygens at 16 each come to 159.5. So the total mass of the reactants is 215.5. And if we do that same calculation for the product, again, works out at 215.5. So the total mass of the reactants, same as the total mass of the products. Why is this? Well, atoms can't be created or destroyed. All that happens in a chemical reaction is that the atoms change partners, as it were. So there's the same number of each type of atom in the reactants as there is in the products. Here we can see that on the left, the reactants, on the right, the products, we've got uh, one iron, one copper, one sulfur, and four oxygens in each of the reactants and the products. And finally, last question, look at this chemical equation. CuCO3 gives CuO plus CO2. Paul starts off with 50 grams of copper carbonate and he makes 50 grams of copper oxide and carbon dioxide altogether. Explain why the mass of the starting materials is the same as the mass of the product. It's not sufficient here to say by the law of conservation of uh, mass. What we have to say is that there is the same number of atoms of each element in the reactants as in the products.